You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Hey folks, welcome. It's Monday night. Welcome and have a happy Monday night. I hope you had a happy Monday. And as promised, we're back from last week. I'm going to start picking up where we left off on some of this talk of Atlantis. We're going to talk about druids. If we get time, we'll do both. If we get even more time, uh, we'll make it into talking about how all of this segues into the flood, the great flood, the great deluge. But first of all, This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Come on over and see all the goodness that is Odyssey Radio. And also, you can watch the simulcast of this show in video. I might have a couple of graphics I throw up tonight, so if you're listening only on audio, you might miss those, but you can come over anytime over to the YouTube channel. And you can uh, take a look uh, either live during the broadcast or check it out in the uh, archives. Uh, Right after the show, it goes immediately to the archives on my YouTube channel. And that's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And always remember, there's a live chat room going on there during the show that you can join with all the other intrep heads that come on over and share their ideas. So you'll have a good time over there. So let's get into the show because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, You've heard all about news today and coronavirus and all of the stuff that's going on in the world. I don't need to focus on that stuff, although there's times I like commenting on it. So no focus on that today. Let's just jump right into our show tonight. And there's some things I want to talk about, and there's a progression of things that all seem to be linked together. Remember, we started talking about the Druids, and then talking about the Druids, in looking at them, it was wondering, did they come from, There's there are theories that say they came from the descendants of Atlantean culture, which led us into talking about Atlantis, and the science fiction fantasy version of Atlantis versus the reality of Atlantis. Did it really exist as a landmass? And was there a vast civilization there? Um, And so we're going to look at a little bit more of that tonight. But then that goes over back to the Druids, and we started talking a little bit about the Druid religion, the Druid belief system, and the Awen. And I want to talk about the Awen just a little bit tonight, uh, because I think this is something we all can still today access this kind of mm, uh, ebb and flow of human thought. And so I think it applies to today, even though it's part of the neo-Druidism that's out there today. So uh, and we're going to go, and we may even hit on, I doubt we'll get there, but the Great Flood. So all of these things, believe it or not, all have links together when we talk about Atlantis. We talk about the Druids. We talk about the Awin. We talk about the Flood. All of those things are linked together. And let's see if we can even start today to link some of these things together. But first, let's talk about the Awin. And the Awin, and what is the Awin? We mentioned this last week, and we talked about it just a little bit. It's this mysterious, mystical force or presence that lies at the heart of Druidry. Now, understanding what the Awen is and what it encompasses lies at the very heart of the Druid's quest. It's a commonly interpreted word meaning divine inspiration. The breath of life, the Holy Spirit that moves through the whole of existence and creates movement and flow. Everything ebbs and flows through the Awen. The Awen's a muse. It's the divine inspiration that comes to us unexpectedly or in moments of grace and deep communion of the self with the self. 
and the information and the presence that lies beyond the mind, beyond what we can tap into with our five senses. It's beyond the veil. It's piercing a veil that we cannot with our five physical senses. It's the essence of all that is. It's contained in every element of existence, the element that connects all others together. It's the innate wisdom of the universe. It's that being aware and awake and in the now and tapping into the, the great wisdom of the universe. And we access, this, we access this when we have found our way back to the divine. And we surrender to what is instead of attempting to create what is not. Remember we talked a long time ago about the dream life that we live and we have to separate ourselves from that to see that there is uh, live lucidly within the dream life to be able to be aware and to be awake and to be in the now. That's what this is talking about. This is what the Awen is. It is at the core of the mystery language, which we started talking about way last week, maybe even the week before that. And, uh, you know, I feel a little bit when I describe this, it's almost like Yoda you know, telling Luke Skywalker, you know, the force, it is in the tree, it's in the rock, the ship, you know, and, <laughs> you know, so he, he uh, in trying to describe that, I think it's kind of Lucas was playing off of the same idea of the a one, And so there's a symbol for the a one, which, uh, which represents the a one. It's, it's got three dots at the top, and three rays of light that come out of them. And this is kind of the symbol for Neo-Druidism today. And uh, uh, it's a symbolic interpretation of the Holy Trinity, a masculine element, and a female element, and the child that originates from the union. Or uh, it's the divine feminine, if you will. The divine masculine and the Holy Spirit that moves through both and makes everything come alive. It's a third interpretation could be past, present, and future, symbolizing the fact that truth lies beyond time and space. So the symbol also repre represents these different paths that lead to the same source, and that originate from the same source, because in this symbol it's got the three at top, and then the three rays that, that, that come out at angles. And... Uh, it represents the path of the Druid, or the spiritual seeker, that can be shaped in many different ways, but that will always lead back to the same point of origin. Uh, vocabulary, rituals, customs might change, but the underlying truth never does. And a good illustration of this is the name that we receive through the divine inspiration for the first step in our journey and that we use to communicate our activities for several years, pravaha. Turns out that pravaha is the Sanskrit version of the Awen, a divine presence and spirit, divine flow, movement, everything that leads back to the same source. And uh, by the way, this was written uh, not by me, but by a woman named Anai Athaskins. And she says of herself, and this is kind of very telling about the Awen, she says she's a priestess and weaver of inspirations and dreams. I create sparks and connections between inner realms and outer perceptions between spirit, soul, and body. The main themes of my multicolored tapestry are the path of the sacred feminine and the quest for harmony with a dash of wonder, magic, and a whole lot of authenticity woven into it. So that gives you an idea of what the Awen is, at least from a poetic definition of what it is. Now, if you look at a stronger definition, let's get a little more technical about the Awen. It's a Welsh, Cornish, Breton word for poetic, for inspiration. In the Welsh tradition, Awen is the inspiration of the poet bards. Remember the Druids, that was one of the classes of Druids, it was to be the bard. And that was considered one of the most important because it was relaying the information in oral tradition. In its personification, Awen is the inspirational muse 
of creative artists in general. The inspired individual, a poet, a soothsayer, uh, is described as an awinid. Awinid. N-Y-D-D. It's a, it's a Welsh word. Awinid. And uh, Emma Restall Orr, the founder and the former head of the Druid Network, defines Awin as flowing spirit. Says that the spirit, energy, and flow is the essence of life. And in current usage, Awin is sometimes described to uh, are ascribed to musicians and poets. And it's also occasionally used as a male and a female given name, Awen. And it appears in the third stanza of Henwiad by Ni... I'm sorry, Henwiad Fi Nahada. <laughs> I don't speak Welsh very well. It's the national anthem of Wales. And uh, e, uh, Awen derives from the Indo-European root Eul, which means to blow and has the same root in the Welsh as Awin, meaning breeze. It's that flow of the muse that comes out. Now, there's some historical attestation to this. The first recorded attestation to the word Awin occurs in Ninius, Ninius's Historia Bretonium, and it's a Latin text that is based in part on the earlier writings of a Welsh monk, Gildas, and it occurs in this phrase, which is, and let's see if I get my Welsh right, it's Tunc Telhern Tat Agwin in Poemate Claret. Uh, I'm sorry, that's my Latin. It's Latin, not, not Welsh. And it just means Telhern, the father of the muse, was then renowned in poetry. And where the old Welsh word Awen occurs in the Latin text describing poets from the 6th century, it's also recorded in its current form in the Canu Luarc. Uh, the ninth or 10th century, where Lewark says, I know by my Awen, indicating that it's a source of instinctive knowledge. So not just the breeze of the muse and the inspiration of poets and artists, but the basis of instinctive knowledge, the Awen. And so on connections between Awen as poetic inspiration, as an infusion from the divine, the book of Taliesin, often implies this. A particularly striking example is contained in the lines Ban Pandorth Pierre and Orwin it's it's Ogerwin Awen Tier. Literally the three elements of inspiration that came splendid out of the cauldron, but implicitly that came from God as Pierre or the cauldron, God being the cauldron. And it can also mean sovereign, which often uh, w with the meaning of the word God. And it's the three elements that's cleverly worked in here, as Awen was sometimes characterized as consisting of three subdivisions. Uh, the Ogerin, o I can't pronounce how they put these consonants together in Welsh, kills me. O G Y R W E N. G Y R W E N don't usually go together, but it's Ogerwin, Ogerwin, which is the same as the Arwin. Uh, so the Ogerwin of, uh, of triune inspiration, the Trinity, the three. And uh, uh, Geraldus Cambronisis referred to those inspired by the Awin as Awindian, Awinidian, Awinidian. Uh, in his description of Wales that he wrote in 1194. And he uh, he says, There are certain persons in Cambria, which is Wales, whom you will find nowhere else called Ewen Indian. And it's Ewen, A-W-E-N, Y-D-D-I-O-N. Ewen Indian. Or the people inspired is what it means. So when consulted upon any doubtful event... They roar out violently, are rendered beside themselves, uh, kind of this aesthetic type of worship, uh, practice, and they become, um, are ecstatic, I'm sorry, not aesthetic, ex ecstatic is what I meant to say there. And they become, as, as it were, possessed by a spirit. They do not deliver the answer to what's required in a connected manner, 
but the person who skillfully observes them will find, after many preambles and many nugatory and incoherent, though ornamented speeches, the desired explanation conveyed in some turn of a word. They are then roused from their ecstasy, as from a deep sleep, and as it were, by violence, compelled to return to their proper senses. After having answered the questions, they do not recover till violently shaken by other people, nor can they remember the replies they have given. If consulted a second or third time upon the same point, they will make use of expressions totally different. Perhaps they speak by the means of fanatic and ignorant spirits, and these gifts are usually conferred upon them in dreams. Some seem to have sweet milk or honey poured on their lips. Others fancy that a written schedule is applied to their mouths. On an awaking, awaking, they publicly declare that they have received this gift. Now, that was written by Geraldus Cambrensis. 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 There it is. And in uh, uh, almost 1200 A.D., and uh, this was from his chapter 16 concerning the soothsayers of this nation and the persons as it were possessed. He's talking about the Welsh. And in 1694, the Welsh poet Henry Vaughan wrote to his cousin, the antiquary, John Aubrey, in response to a request for some information about the remnants of Druidry that were still in existence in Wales at that time, in the uh, late 1600s. And he said this, the ancient bards communicated nothing of their knowledge, but by way of tradition, which I suppose to be the reason that we have no account left, nor any sort of remains, nor other monuments of their learning of, way, uh, of the way of living. As to the bards, you shall have a most curious account of them. This vein of poetry they called Awen which in their language signifies rapture, or a poetic furor, and in truth, as many of them as I have seen, have conversed with are, as I may say, gifted or inspired with it. I was told by a very sober-knowing person, now dead, that in his time there was a young lad, fatherless and motherless, so very poor that he was forced to beg, but at last was taken up by a rich man, that he kept that kept a great stock of sheep upon the mountains not far from the place where i now dwell who clothed them clothed him sent him into the mountains to keep his sheep there in summer time following the sheep and looking to their lambs he fell into a deep sleep in which he dreamt that he saw a beautiful young man with a garland of green leaves upon his head and an hawk upon his fist with a quiver full of arrows at his back coming toward him while several measures or tune, what whistling several measures or tunes all the way, at last let the hawk fly at him, which he dreamt got into his mouth and inward parts, and suddenly awakened in a great fear and consternation. But possessed with such a vein, or a gift of poetry, that he left the sheep and went about the country, making songs upon all occasions, and came to be the most famous bard in all the country in his time. And that was Henry Vaughan in a letter to John Aubrey in 1694. So the Awen was recognized um, as being the poetic muse and sometimes the stuffs of visions that came to you, sometimes in your dreams, sometimes in your waking hours. In some forms of neo-Druidism, the term Awen is symbolized by an emblem that shows the three straight lines um, that spread apart as they move downward like three rays of light uh, drawn within a circle or a series of circles of varying thickness, often with a dot or a point atop each line, signifying that trinity at the top. And the British Druid order attributes the symbol to Lolomoranag, and it's been adopted by some Neo-Druids. And the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, we mentioned them last week, the OBOD, describe the three lines as rays emanating from three points of light, with those points representing the triple aspect of deity 
and also the points of which the sun rises on the equinoxes and solstices, known as the triad of the sunrises. And the emblem is used by the OBOD, and it's surrounded by three circles, representing the three circles of creation. And various neo-Druidic groups and individuals have their own interpretation of the A1. And the three lines relate to earth, sea, and air. Uh, body, mind, and spirit. Love, wisdom, and truth. It's also said that the Awen stands for not simply inspiration, but for inspiration of truth. And without Awen, one cannot proclaim truth, because it's also that sacred knowledge. And so the three foundations of Awen are the understanding of truth, the love of truth, and the maintaining of truth. So there you go. And by the way, a version of the A1 was approved by U.S. Veterans Administration in 2017 for use on uh, veteran headstones. Now, I've got a picture of what the A1 looks like here. And I did not preload this. And this is just a, a very a simple drawing of it. But uh, uh, let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to put it up in, uh, let's see if I can even uh, do this on the fly as we're talking. I've tried this before. I, you know, I prepped a couple of other um, uh, uh, visuals for tonight's show that um, have nothing to do with the a one And so I, I didn't really uh, prep to talk this deeply about the a one but here it is. I'm going to bring this in just so you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the three circles that are uh, surrounding each other, and then the three dots or points of light at the top, and the three rays that are coming down. And if you ever see this, this is the symbol of the Awen, and it is the uh, uh, also the symbol of Neo-Druidism. And uh, it's not this phony baloney stuff where, oh, the new Druids, we got to have a logo that we can put on T-shirts and caps. It's something that was a, a symbol that was created so they could uh, uh, have a physical representation of what they're talking about here. And uh, here is this image. Let's put this in for you. And uh, we're just going to call it Awen. Sorry, I'm doing this on the fly so we can get it up here. Here it is. Here's the Awen. Boom, there it is. Now you see it. Now this is the Awen with the trinity at the top, the three dots. Or the, ray, or the sources, the three suns, the equinoxes, and the three rays of light that come out, surrounded by the three circles. So uh, there are those of you just listening, you're not going to be able to uh, see this uh, unless you come and check out the archives or join the group quick uh, over on my YouTube page. But uh, there it is. There's the A1, the symbol of the A1. All right. So uh, let me turn that off, and let's get back to what we're talking about here. All right, so we go back to the Awen now. And uh, there's a little bit more I want to say about the Awen uh, before we really start getting into a splintering back off into Atlantis. And uh, where are we for time? Let me just check my clock here. You know what? We're out of time in this segment. Perfect timing. So when we come back... We'll talk about this a little more. You sit tight. We'll be right back.
All right, folks, thanks for waiting through that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. And that's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Check out all the goodness that is Odyssey Radio. Find out all the different outlets where you can hear this show audibly and on the radio. And also come on over to my YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And join the chat room that's going now with the other Intrep heads. You can do it right now if you're listening to the show on Odyssey. Also flip over to YouTube and join the chat room. You can listen to them simulcast together. All right, folks. Thanks for being here. We were talking about the AWIN, that universal knowledge, that inspirational knowledge, that seeking of truth, that triune seeking of truth of the Druids. That really is, it's like the force. It's like, uh, if you want to, you know, understand it from a uh, an illustrative fictional point of view. Um, the Awen and the Sun. Uh, if you attend or watch a public druidic ceremony, you're going to hear those assembled and maybe be asked to join in the calling of the Nine Awens. Now, it's rather like the Buddhist mantra, Ayum. Uh, this is the druidic name for the life, the inspirational force of generation behind the universe that's linked with the sun. And some druid or s's identify this with the sound that called forth creation. And books are going to tell you that this is pronounced Awen. A-A-H dash O-O dash E-N. Awen. Awen with the emphasis on the A. Ah. So the Awen, as three equally weighted symbols as a monotone. But in practice, when you have a lot of people calling Awen or Awen in the dusk or the early dawn light, the sounds emerge so that it becomes more like the sound of the sea, a wind rippling through the plains of corn, or the call of the birds going home at night, especially if it's called on a rising note. You imagine all these people at the rising sun uh, chanting Awen. That's what you're getting. So practice calling Awens or Awens, I've been calling them, uh, six or nine in monotones. Then as though you were ascending or descending scales, sing in a cave, a tunnel, um, a great marble hallway, uh, in dense woodland in a variety of or valley of rocks, or an old quarry, and let the echoes swell your voice. Sing it as you walk. Dance it in your grove. Swim it through the water, and so the sound will become part of you. This is almost like allowing this to become part of who you are. Uh, And so I'm almost describing what you could look at as a a worship of sorts, although it's not worshiping an object. It's it's a practice of meditation. Uh, So the the sound will become part of you, like aum. It's the creative sound that fills you with power and certainty, and you no longer worry, and you're saying it correctly. Like the aum that you see, you know, we make fun of that an awful lot. So the Awen is very much like that. The Awen is also a symbol that's drawn by druidesses and druids as a way of invoking and and sending blessing. It's very popular at the end of a druidic emails, and it can easily legally be downloaded by right-clicking on the image and select Save As for non-commercial purposes. You can see this if you're in contact with druids or druidesses who use the Awen. And uh, it consists of three rays of the sun. Uh, there are different, two con- different contemporary explanations for its form. One says it's at the time of the midsummer sunrise. The sun casts three spreading rays of light. The A1 which opens the gates of Anwin, the doorway to the other world. See how mystical this stuff can get? Uh, The other view is that they represent the points at which the sun rises on the equinoxes and the solstices, the three dots, or what we call the trinity. 
and that it's due east at the time of the equinoxes is represented by the central bar of the Awen that comes down. Uh, it's at the time of the summer and winter solstices that the sun rises in the east-northeast and the east-southeast, respectively, and these would form the bars on either side of the main that drops down. Uh, the, an Awen turned to face the east shows the direction of the winter. If you took that symbol and turned it so it's facing east, shows the direction of the winter and summer solstice sunrises. And though the Awen sign itself is not ancient, the formation of the three sunrises was marked by three stones out of, outside a number of stone circles that still exist, these megalithic circles. The origins of the Awen, while the concept of Awen and its solar connections are, pro are uh, uh, properly uh, regarded as revivalist rather than an ancient Celtic symbol, some Druidesses and Druids do believe that the Awen, translated as flowing spirit, might be an ancient concept that was Christianized when Christianity took over, really, Druidism. Uh, they point to such examples as tales of the 6th century bard Taliesin, or Merlin, and these tales were recorded centuries later. And he claimed to have had received the three drops of Awen that splashed from the cauldron of Keridwen. And these three drops are depicted in some symbols of Awen falling from the sky. And if the Awen does come from the cauldron of Keridwen, then the solar power is female inspired. And it's directed, and the solar connection is that it is brewed from herbs and flowers that grow in the sun. And it represents a rebirth into light, such as the boy Gion, or Gwyn, uh, experienced when he was swallowed in the form of a grain by Caridwin in the shape of a hen, and was born from her womb as the bard magician Taliesin nine months later. Gwyn, foster son of Caridwin, was stirring the cauldron at the time and claimed that three drops of inspiration splashed on his fingers accidentally an explanation not accepted by the irate Caridwin who pursued him in animal different forms and what has become a classic example of shape-shifting. So the Awen, or inspiration, was endowed by women, a woman priestess, a druidess, at early druid initiations. Uh, the Penteithon in Pembrokeshire. Uh, initiates would remain in total darkness for several days awaiting rebirth. Then nine virgin priestesses or druidesses would stir and they would breathe the pure life force on a cauldron in which a sun brew of barley, flowers, herbs, and sea foam was created. And this would-be bards each drank three drops to represent Gwyn's three drops of inspiration that he stole from the cauldron. And the rest was poured away to symbolize casting the former life of the initiate. And this may originally have been a solar goddess ceremony and may predate the Druid traditions. We're going back to the sun again with this. And the three bars may have represented the triple or three aspected goddess, uh, Bridget, goddess of the sun and fire. And the rays are sometimes positioned within the center of a triple circle, as I showed you the, the, the line drawing of uh, the Awen, to represent the three Celtic realms, earth, sea, and sky, uh, the circles of existence, the passage of the soul, or simply enclosed in a circle. And working with the Awen is the inspiration of the sun. All of this is pretty exciting. It's gateways of light into other realms and absorbing drops of inspiration or liquid light. It's distilled from the sun at its times of power, and it's brewed in the cauldron of Caridwin. So before um, I go any further on the, the Awen, into the philosophical and the inspirational aspects of Awen, um, make and use the sun symbol to access that door. We absorb the power in the sun into our lives, a winter or summer. Here's what you do. Now, give you kind of a, in a sense, this is kind of a spell. In a sense, it's more a meditation. 
draw your A1 in the sand, or in sand, or with your finger. Uh, earth or soil, do it that way. Uh, create one out of seeds. Nuts or twigs, surround it with a circle to focus and concentrate the power. Uh, alternately, you can create one out of small stones or shells in your garden. I've got a big pile of stones that my kids and my wife have been picking up for weeks over at uh, where they're digging up to put in new housing. And uh, you can take stones and make a uh, an awen. Work in the sunlight when you uh, when you can, so the circle is filled with light and pebbles that gleam. You could, of course, use glass nuggets. You can go to the store and buy beads and do this. And when it snows, the sun will melt away the whiteness, leaving the symbol intact. So indoors, you can create a miniature one from clay or on paper or create one with quartz and tiny crystals. You can stand or sit facing the south at the point where the three sunbeams converge. Work at the brightest point of the day, visualizing the brilliance of the day or the season. You can visualize one of the beautiful Celtic sun or fire goddesses haloed around the sun. Remember Bridget hanging her cloak on the sun wheel? Visualize Caridwen directly ahead of you, stirring a cauldron of pure gold, whose essence radiates as a rich rivulet of light gold around your circle. Feel also the golden soil of the earth, uh, the earth mothers that are warming you beneath, heated by the molten volcanic forces, the sun beneath the surface of the world. Doesn't this sound like I'm drawing you into some kind of pagan ritual here? This is something you can do to practice this, to experiment with it. Breathe in the golden light through your nose, slowly, gently, exhaling darkness until you create a steady, continuous rhythm and you're no longer aware of your breathing, but only the inflow of light from all around you, above and beneath, and around into every pore. This is something I was talking about with my young 10-year-old son the other day, who, I don't know if we're beginning to wonder if he has some anxiety issues. He gets very angry. He gets very worked up. So worked up that he gets mad at everybody and over small uh innocuous things and I had him sitting here in the office and I told him son stop I said I want you to practice breathing no he didn't want to do that and I said here's I want you to do this I want you to breathe in your nose slowly out slowly and I described breathing to him now this is not a bad sort of ritual to set up with your kids with yourself to practice calming to practice accessing the Awen, accessing inspiration, accessing greater truth, inspirational truth, knowledge. So I'm not leading you in anything weird here. This is meditative. So um, as you continue the breathing exercise, visualize the light upward from your toes right to the tips of your fingers, downward through the crown of your head, Inward, like a rushing waterfall of light, in which up is down and is out, and you are the light. Begin your call, Awen. You can say, Awun. Uh, you can do this or not. You might feel silly because it looks like things that we make fun of sometimes. At first, low and slowly, and then higher with greater intensity, but maintain a comfortable pitch so you don't tip over, lose the sense of control. Stillness within the cascading light. Uh, continue, you can see light rating, radiating from within you. You're now connected with source of power and inspiration. Hold the moment. And when you feel totally at one with the power of the light and the sun, then allow the I ones to slowly fade and become slower until they're no longer more than a whisper. And at last return to the heart of stillness and silence. So make you can make a sign if you want the awen, the palm of your hand, uh, you know, knowing that you're far from home or anxious, and recall your sun's circle, become connected to the light. And if, as you work through this ritual, you place beside you or hold a clear quartz or a crystal or citrine with the circle, it'll become empowered, and you can paint it on gold in gold after the ritual awen 
symbol to keep you powerful and protected. This is all very new agey, some of this. So pardon me for that. I, I, I hate the coming across as new age. I want you to think of this in ways of tapping into ancient sources and things that can help you clear yourself, become aware, become awake, and all of that. So there it is. That's how you do this stuff. Um, the A1 is inspiration, and it affects your life. There are numerous ways of obtaining inspiration of A1. And as you learn more about druidry, you might be able to find that your spiritual and psychic awareness spontaneously evolve. So this is stuff as you're looking into these things, practicing some of these old rules. You don't have to be a druid or a druidess to practice these things. These could be things that you try. And I'm not a weirdo. I don't walk around barefoot all the time with a rope belt and uh, growing my hair out and you know, painting weird symbols on my face. I don't do that stuff. But <clears throat> I do know I need to calm myself at times. I need to connect with something that is greater, the greater source out there. And this is a way that you might be able to... It doesn't matter what you believe. This isn't a belief system. This is one of accessing something, practicing something physical, and focusing on perhaps something spiritual. And so uh, give this a try if you ever get a chance. And the, Qu the Celtic druid S's and their priestess forebears lived much closer to nature than we do. They could move from dimension to dimension as easily as we pass into the next room. And druidesses and druids today have usually had to choose the earthly path. And we have no communities to support us or free access throughout our physical world without danger from other tribes. So we know this stuff exists. This is ancient practice. And so there it is. That's what the Awen is. And it's the symbol um, of infinite wisdom. The symbol of truth. It's the symbol of inspiration. And it's that stuff that flows through all of creation. So it might be worth a try. I'm going to practice it. I'm going to experiment with this, and you can too. And uh, I'll report in, and I'll tell you how that has worked for me. So the Awin is this mysterious, mystical force or presence that lies at the heart of druidry, but I think it lies at the heart of everything. So... Don't think me too nutty on this stuff. It's an interesting practice. And perhaps this is some of what we have lost as we've gotten into modern civilization. We've eschewed gods and goddesses, angels, uh, devils, demons, uh, celestial beings. We've taken all that, pushed it aside for the secular. And we've secularized our lives. When you think of the current situation we're in with the whole virus and the world shut down, no matter what conspiracy theory is right or wrong, we're all in the midst of this right now. And there are ways to combat what it does to your, your soul, your life. This might be one of those ways. This is like prayer. This is like uh, meditation. This is something to give it a try and uh, connect with greater truth see what comes of it and all of this as i said everything i'm talking about today is kind of intertwined because this whole idea of the awen comes from the druids which comes from what has been purported to be the legendary city of atlantis or continent of atlantis the whole tale and so I did want to, and we've only got uh, well, we got about six minutes left here um, in the show tonight, and I want to get back into the Atlantean bit a bit. Uh, I took a little more time on the A1. Like I said, if we get there, we get there. If we don't, we, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. So Atlantis, we, let's examine the legendary tale of Plato. 
uh, around 360 BCE in his dialogues of Timaeus and Critias, the Greek philosopher Plato introduced an incredible story, and it was this tale of an enigmatic island civilization which has since captivated the imaginations of every generation that's followed. And it was the story of Atlantis. And it was thought to be one of the most advanced societies of the ancient world, an idyllic island paradise of skillful navigators capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean to conquer and to explore. And as Plato said, For it is related in our records how once upon a time your state stayed the course of a mighty host. And it was possible for travelers of that time to cross from it, the Atlantis, to, uh, or Atlantis, to other islands, and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them, which encompasses the veritable Atlantic Ocean. Now, Plato's tale of this legendary land from which the Druids are supposed to have been the remnant of their uh, higher teaching class. Uh, Plato's tale, today popular theories, place Atlantis in locations like off the coast of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, in the eastern Mediterranean, around the Azores Islands in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, the Bimini Road off the coast of the United States, or even in more exotic locations such as Antarctica, Indonesia, and of course more mainstream studies point to the tiny island of Santorini, which is off the island of Crete, and Malta, and Spain. So you can see, Atlantis has been placed all over the globe and other archaeological sites around the Mediterranean. And all, uh, overall, there are countless theories on the location of Atlantis, while more seem to surface every year. And despite the scientific and the non-scientific speculation, and due to the lack of tangible evidence, scientific evidence, that it existed in the past, the vast majority of modern historians believe that Plato's tale of Atlantis was either a myth that he was putting forward, or they assume Plato crafted an allegorical story around a fictional place while using a mix of real elements from later times to put forward a political message. And so, is it possible then that the story of Atlantis was entirely a figment of Plato's imagination? It's, it's possible, and although if the story isn't real, how otherwise can we explain the tangible evidence that supports Plato's story, including a recently discovered site that perfectly matches Atlantis's description? And essentially, and contrary to a common belief that Plato's Atlantis may have been somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, a recent study shows that Plato's island of Atlantis was in the Mediterranean Sea, and just a few kilometers north of the island of Santorini. And this now underwater primary island, along with the island of Santorini, fits Plato's entire description of Atlantis. And so, it's lost in translation, folks. To successfully decode Plato's puzzle, and to ensure that the meaning of the original Greek story isn't lost during translation, the English version was compared to the Greek format, which is entirely different syntactical structure. Actually, when it comes to the Greek, sometimes even a single comma can cause a short sentence to have two different complete meanings. I studied Koine Greek, which was the, the, the Greek of commerce and of, and of uh, um, uh, widespread language use in the biblical era. Uh, after the time, of course, of Alexandria, the New Testament era. And it was a very logical language, and it could mean certain things depending on, you know, in the English, it, you might read a sentence that says, the sky was blue that day. And yet, and that's how it interprets into English. Yet in the Greek, it might say the sky was of, you know, a uh, uh, um, an enhanced glowing magical blue. You know, the, the difference in the Greek language might be completely different 
than the way it interprets literally into the English. And so, a good example also is the famous quote from the Oracle of Delphi, who says, Go, return, not die in war. And can it have two entirely opposite meanings, depending on where a missing comma is supposed to be, uh, before or after the word not, because it says, Go, comma, return, not in war, return, not die in war. And this recent evaluation of Plato's text revealed that simple errors and flawed interpretations by early translators led many researchers in the past to look for Atlantis in all the wrong places. And consequently, unlike all the past discoveries, including recent ones that led to more speculation rather than real evidence, for the first time, there is a tangible site where all the physical characteristics perfectly match Plato's account. And it's a lost island that's found... And it seems that 11,000 years ago, according to Plato, the story of Atlantis took place. Many of the Cyclades Islands were connected by a flat terrain today called the Cyclades Plateau. And this now 400 feet underwater plateau formed the body of a large island. While the modern island, 400 feet below the surface, I'm saying. Uh, and the modern islands of the Cyclades fashioned rows of mountains that emerged in all the right places when those are compared to Plato's story and we're out of time. So we're going to dig into this more tomorrow. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Cyclades Islands and how this may just be the lost Atlantis. All right, folks, thanks for being here. 23-hour break. We'll be back tomorrow. Have a good night.